<laughs> We're live. All right. Good evening and happy Thursday. Welcome to Thursday night at Living Word Family Church. This is These Final Days Ministries. I'm that guy right there, Pastor Ryan Speakman. Everything good, Ben? Serving under my favorite pastor in the whole world, Pastor Maureen Collins. Yay. We love, we love our pastors. So, so um, yeah, we'll see how the room fills as, the, as, as we get going here. But, uh, but in the meantime, yeah, glad you guys are here tonight. As you all know, this is our only normal class for the whole month of November. Uh, we do have a class next week, but that's a special class. I'm going to, you know, talk about that. Um, but in the meantime, what's our topic tonight? What exactly are the four horsemen of the apocalypse? And I know we already kind of, kind of intro that last class, but you know, we're going to, we're going to keep the ball rolling here. So, <clears throat> so going to be a good one. Um, bear with me. Got to get to my presentation here. Okay. All right. And, um, oh, by the way, oh, I should have put this up. So, um, welcome to everybody watching on uh, TikTok. Hello. Uh, we usually get about 300 or so on TikTok. And welcome to everybody joining us on Facebook and YouTube. And if you are watching on Facebook or YouTube or TikTok for that matter, um, please remember to uh, like our channel, subscribe to our channel, like the video, you know, whatever, whatever it is, depending on the, the platform that you're watching us on. Uh, because that helps to grow the ministry, which helps us to, you know, accomplish more of what we're trying to accomplish here. So uh, here is our calendar for this month. And again, it's kind of a kind of an odd calendar. Um, oh, and by the way, uh, Wanda and Rex brought our lovely dessert tonight, homemade lemon bars and the little uh, bacon and egg things. So let's give her a hand. Thank you, Wanda. Yeah. She, like everything you guys bring is great. But but Wanda's lemon bars. I'm sorry. That's my favorite. So. Don't tell Skylar I said that. So, um, by the way, okay, so speaking of desserts, so this is tonight's class, right, November 7th. Uh, so we do have class next week. So everybody say in one week, one week. We, have class. we have class. But as you can see here, it's a special class. We're going to have our uh, guests, uh, speakers uh, direct from Israel uh, joining us. They're actually arriving in town tomorrow. So I'm going to let you know. I'm, I have a couple slides here, but I'm going to let you guys know. Uh, what their schedule is while they're here. So hopefully you can make it out to to uh, one or both of the big events that, that we're doing with them. So um, anyways, yeah, the week after that uh, is our normal skip day. I'm working on my book, uh, part three of my book series. And then after that is Thanksgiving. So do you guys want to come and learn about the end of the world on Thanksgiving or just stay home and eat turkey and go to bed? Early? Okay, I, I figured. So, so uh, I went ahead and created December's calendar just so we get our minds right on that. So um, so this December, we're completely back to a normal schedule. Uh, we'll be meeting on the first Thursday of, uh, December and then the third Thursday. And then from there going into the new year, we're just, on, we'll, we'll be on a regular schedule. So, so not, not too bumpy this year. Sometimes I'm traveling during these months and thank God I'm not traveling during these months this year. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Um, oh, and by the way, uh, you guys, please welcome our friend, Bill, give Bill a hand. And uh, so Bill's first time in the class and Bill's um, wife and, uh, or I'm sorry, girlfriend and daughter, Suzanne and Christina are going to uh, try to join us. I think they'll get here a little bit later, right? So did you hear from Mark and Connie yet, Ben? Um, they have life, uh, life oh, that's tonight. Okay. So, <laughs> so um, I'm taking home all the lemon bars and they will go to good use. So, <laughs> all right. Anyways. Uh, all right. So if you're interested in this ministry, anything, everything about the ministry, Oh, good evening. So you must be Suzanne? Yes, nice to meet you. I'm Pastor Ryan. Everybody say hi, Suzanne. Okay. Uh, and normally we have a bigger room, Suzanne, but um, I don't know, people are traveling, they're doing other stuff, you know, whatever. We're going to have fun tonight. And we live stream this, and we also uh, put it on YouTube and Facebook after the fact, so people catch it later. Anyways, um, we will have about 300 people watching us on TikTok, so, so that's fun. Uh, my best-selling book series, part one and part two, been out for uh, quite a while, right? Um, while you're, it, so you can access them from my website, thesefinaldays.org, all the other content. Um, while you're there, if the Holy Spirit so moves you, and I mean that sincerely, you can help to support the ministry, and um, your support makes a gigantic difference, sincerely. So um, just click, uh, click the button here, click to donate, click here, or there's a donate button up there. And, and I'm not shy about uh, 
inviting you guys to ask the Holy Spirit, should we contribute financially to the ministry? Because it's been working and the ministry has been growing and that's how things are done. And thank you, God. And thank you, you guys. Oh, I think that's, oh, by the way, when you click on the donate button on the main page, it brings you to this page. You can donate by PayPal, Venmo, Zelle, or even mail us a check. Um, do we still take cash, Ben? I don't know. Okay, well, we're passing the bucket, so that's my cue. But thank you guys for uh, donating and being so generous with the ministry. You guys all know it goes to tremendously good use. Every penny is used for ministry purposes. So, uh, And so speaking of my book series, uh, just today I noticed I- I'm getting like a ton of sales since November started on, on the two books on Amazon. They've been out for years, right? Bestsellers on Amazon. Um, working on part three, diligently, coming soon, TM. Um, and, and I started to remember the last few years, every November, that's like my biggest month in sales. Can anyone guess why that might be the case? Every November, not just this one cause the election or whatever. Oh, uh, Christina, right? That's Christina. Hi, Christina. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Bill said you guys were coming. So everybody say hi, Christina. So we have three, three new people. Um, anyway, so why, why do my book sales, why do I sell the most books in the month of November? It's, huh? Yeah, because it's Christmas. It's so funny. I'm thinking, like, are people worried about the end of the world or something? No, I think it's Christmas. So uh, last year I posted this on my Facebook page, the end of the world makes a great Christmas gift. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, it's funny, right? Uh, made a couple of people mad because I said that. It's like, you know, you, you don't recognize a joke when you see it. But anyways, yeah, so... So uh, if you have a loved one and you're not sure what to get them, these make great stocking stuffers, if the stocking's big enough to hold that book. So, all right. So um, our guests, so again, Noam and Adid, uh, direct from Israel. Uh, Noam's been here several times. Adid's been here once. It, years ago uh, was the last time they were here. It was before the pandemic. So they're coming back again. Uh, they're actually getting to town tomorrow. And then on uh, Sunday, we're doing our big event with Noam and Adi. So they're, they're, they're going to be talking about um, the war, what's happened over the last year. They purposely timed their visit for after the elections here because uh, being overseas, they just hear like all the chaos that happens in the United States, not in Havasu, but they wanted to wait, you know, because who knows what's going to happen, right? They're very excited and happy to be coming to Havasu now. Let me just say that, <laughs> right? And uh, uh, it's going to be a great time. So Sunday at 5 o'clock p.m. at the Domes. You guys all know what that is, right? Uh, Inspire the Church, uh, 2700 Jamaica Boulevard. If you know what that, knows what that is, right? Uh, I hope you can all make it. It's going to be a tremendous event. Uh, I'm co-hosting with Pastor Timothy Giles at Inspire. They've worked hard to get their balcony done in time for this event. And uh, we've been really marketing it, even on like KNTR, Secular Radio, and of course KNLB. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm expecting a good turnout, but yeah, try to come if you can. It's going to be amazing. And we're calling it Israel now healing in the shadow of war. That's a uh, no and Adi Bedin. Um, and four days later, our next class next Thursday, uh, they never do this. No and Adi. We we were just over there with them. Ben and I, and Tom and Mark were over in Israel with them last May of last year, a few months before the October 7th thing happened and hung out with them a lot. Right, Ben? Yeah, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum, the Dead Sea, Jordan. We went with a yeah dinner, all that stuff, Shabbat dinner at the very end. But anyway, so um, I've actually gone to a lot of work to put together this whole week for them so they could, they're going to go on the radio, they're going to go on KNLB, hopefully on KNTR, and then speak at several different churches, speak at the uh, synagogue, you know, Chabad here in town. And uh, I got them a, a place to stay, um, long story. Um, so I said, you guys owe me. They never do Q&A. They never do just open session where they take questions. I said, you guys are doing it for my class. So that's a week from today. So next Thursday, same, you know, normal class time, same, same location here. Should have a lot more people here. I know that um, Sam, who owns Sam Shooting Emporium, he's coming. Um, I think Stan, the president of the synagogue, he's coming, you know, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, should be great. Don't miss it next week. That's going to be a, a great one. So, so um you guys know I've been trying to do a little bit more current events if they pertain directly to our topic, which is the end times, right? So um, I don't know if you guys heard, but apparently there was an election on Tuesday. It's, listen, it was, it was all over the news, I guess, if you watch the news. And I, I heard it went fairly well. I mean, that's just, you know, that's the rumor. So, um, so, so every election, Pam, my wife, stays up like all night long 
watching the results. And then the next morning she comes and wakes me up and says, Oh, you miss this and this. Like I miss all the excitement. Right. So, uh, this year, um, God rewarded me by staying up late because this whole thing was wrapped up before midnight our time, right. In essence. And, uh, so 1130, it was pretty clear. 1145, uh, the, the, um, the opponent who did not win the election, that whole square was clearing out. And when I saw that, it's like, okay, that it's, it's pretty evident. So, uh, by 12, 15, 30 minutes later, um, president elect Trump, they used to, we used to call him former president Trump or the media used to, but now he's president elect Trump. Interesting. I listen, Bill, I'm, I really am not supposed to be political in here, but anyways, just, <laughs> that's why, that's why I'm containing my, you know, <laughs> so, but, uh, so, so it's about a 45 minute speech. Did anybody see Trump's uh, victory speech live? Uh, yeah, Bill did very cool. Yep. Debbie stayed up for it. Oh, after the fact. Okay. Yeah. We just stayed up and watched it. And, um, and when, when he came out on stage and then, and then he brought his whole, you know, entourage with him, which was very cool. I thought that was very impressive. Um, for, you know, it was like two fifteen in the morning, their time in, in Mar-a-Lago, Florida. Right. But, uh, but, but as they came out, I noticed something on stage that really caught my attention. And that's why I'm standing in my living room with my phone waiting t- to get some like good shots. And I've got, and I've got my three favorite pictures I took and something on stage that is extremely pertinent to our topic of the end times, uh, does not surprise me a bit from the standpoint of what I teach, which is end times prophecy. Uh, does anybody see it? Ben, come on. Yeah. What's his son-in-law's name? Oh, yeah. Jared Kushner. Okay. So. So um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it, but it is pertinent. This is, you know, I teach the end times. I've been teaching it, you know, weekly, right, because I'm on the radio show and all that too, right, for 25 years. So, so you know, I want to take a minute and, and discuss this. It's, it's very, very, very important. Um, in fact, this may, may actually pertain to a specific person who was mentioned in Bible prophecy from like thousands of years ago, a couple thousand years ago. Uh, so, I mean, maybe, so that, that's a big deal. So, so, um, so Jared Kushner, uh, the president's son-in-law, I think we all know that, um, during, uh, president Trump's first administration, right. Uh, he brought in Kushner, his son-in-law to, to, um, to start working on this idea to bring peace to the middle East. It's unheard of. The only way to do that, that means peace between Israel and a bunch of her Arab Muslim neighbors who have gone to war against Israel four, maybe five times, depends on how you count, since Israel became a nation again back in 1948. So, so, so let's say four, just keep it conservative, right? So four times all these countries that surround Israel, like literally attacked it militarily, tried to wipe it off the map. And what Kushner, this, this, you know, skinny young looking kid is, you know, all clean cut is going to go over and like bring peace to this, right? So we all know that he did it. I mean, got the ball rolling in a very substantial way, and that's known as what, Ben? What'd you say? Abraham. The Abraham Accords. Okay, so there, there, you know, we could do a whole couple of classes just on that, and we're not. Nobody panic. But, um, but, but just the name is so pertinent, and, and the way the whole thing came about. Uh, Jared's background, um, he is an Orthodox Jew. Okay, uh, Ivanka, his wife, Donald Trump's daughter, converted to Judaism because she married this uh, extremely successful in his own right. I mean... Uh, I think before he even married Ivanka, he already owned at least one skyscraper on Wall Street. I don't own a skyscraper on Wall Street. I don't even own a skyscraper in Havasu, my gosh, right? Um, and by the way, the address was 666 Wall Street. It was just a coincidence, okay? Um, and I'm not saying that, okay, not at all. I like Jared. I, I love the guy. I love what he's doing. Um, I think he may be uh, fulfilling Bible prophecy, maybe, okay? So uh, now, here, here's why I was so excited to see him on stage. And and, and surprised, but then not surprised, right? Uh, because when all the mess happened four years ago, the January 6th riots at the Capitol, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Jared and Ivanka actually uh, distant, distanced themselves away from, from President Trump because that was, any way you cut it, you know, right or wrong, it wasn't Trump's, you know, wherever you stand on this, it was really bad optics, okay? It just didn't look good. It was way too controversial for what, what Jared was intent on pushing forward. So, so he achieved the Abraham Accord September 15th, 2020, just a month and a half before the election. 
It was finalized between Israel, the United States, the UAE, and Bahrain, the UAE and Bahrain being, you know, Sunni Muslim countries on the Saudi Peninsula. I mean, this was gigantic, right? And then later on, uh, Sudan joined it, Morocco joined it. There's been some other, you know, updates. So, um, so, so President uh, Biden, we know, when he got into office, he did what Trump had done to Obama. Okay, now I'm getting a little bit political, but it's just facts, right? He did what Trump had done to Obama, which is, here, I'm going to cancel everything that Trump accomplished during his presidency. There's one thing he didn't touch, just one thing, and that was the Abraham Accords, the Abraham Accords. So this was, this was actually Trump's crowning achievement. He gave full credit to his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, uh, for this, right? He still does. But, but that was under the Trump administration. But Biden didn't touch it. That was, like the, that was Trump's greatest achievement, okay? H- hypothetically, my, in my opinion, it was, because I teach about end times prophecy, right? Um, but Kushner did not want to see this end, the Abraham Accords. Guess what? The Biden administration for the last four years have been working with Kushner. They've been pushing the Abraham Accords. They've been meeting with the Saudis because that's the big prize on the Abraham Accords of Saudi Arabia. And that's the one thing that the Biden administration, not only did they not undo it, but they've been trying to push it forward. It hasn't budged because there's been a lot of like chaos in the last four years. It hasn't, you know, like the war, for example, in Israel over the last more than a year now, right? Uh, but now Trump is coming back in office. Uh, Kushner, just to see him on stage with his father-in-law, it, they're, like they're back together. I mean, th- this is this is going to change. And if you guys go back and look at videos because you're going to think I'm just like like trying to pat myself on the back or spin this. But hopefully, you guys remember I have said more than once that this this is not over. That that Kushner's that this is going to come back and Kush, this is going to keep going forward. The Saudis are going to join. Um, so, you know, and this isn't cause I have a crystal ball or I'm a prophet. I'm not, I'm a teacher. That's it. Right. Uh, but it just, it's the only thing that makes sense in the context of end times prophecy. So, uh, so this is, this is an article that just came out yesterday on CNN. Okay. And it's, uh, the article is my twin brother pointed me to this. Here's what's at stake in the middle East under Trump's second term. And, uh, this by the way is, is a big banner on a building in, um, Jerusalem. I think the article said, uh, congratulations, Trump. Make Israel great. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Uh, and listen, we all know that um, it look, with the polls over the last you know year or whatever, uh, it looked like you know Trump and Kamala were neck and neck. Uh, that and, and that Trump's popularity here was like questionable, whatever. Right in Israel, some of the polls there showed as many as like ninety plus percent approval rating for Trump. Like they love Trump over in Israel. And Trump even made a joke at one point: if I ran for our, for president in Israel, I get elected like they wouldn't even need an election, right? True story. By the way, when Noam and Adi are here next Thursday, help me to remember we're going to drill them about that. What do you guys think about Trump? What does Israel think about Trump? Because not just for our class, but I want this to go on our live stream and YouTube and Facebook and, and get this out there. We don't get the inside track, you know, a lot when we're here, right? So from the article that came out yesterday, Boaz Bismuth, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, a member of Israel's parliament, that's the Knesset, yeah, the Knesset says right there, from Netanyahu's Likud party, told CNN that Trump's election came at the right time as it would provide an opportunity to expand the Abraham Accord. So right at the very start, an article in CNN, the Knesset is thinking about this, they're talking about this, and the Abraham Accords are on the front of everyone's minds again. As the wars in Gaza and Lebanon are coming to an end, the Accords, a set of agreements facilitated by Trump's first administration that saw Israel normalize relations with four Arab nations, because uh, it also includes um, uh, Sudan and Morocco. I did mention that, right? Uh, it's funny. I, I didn't realize it until yesterday when I was like finalizing tonight's class that uh, do you get, does anyone know? So Sudan, I think, um, joined the, the Accords. The, the original signers were September 15, 2020. Sudan uh, joined in December, so after Trump had already lost the election, right, as far as what the, um, the numbers said, right? Um, take it easy, Ryan. Control yourself. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but you want to hear the date that Morocco signed? This is crazy. It's a crazy date. January 6, 2021. So literally the day of the Capitol riots, that's when, the, when Morocco signed on to the Accords. That's weird. Anyways. Uh, but prospects of an independent Palestinian st- put prospects of an independent Pal- Palestinian state on the back burner. So this is a key point that the Abraham Accords. Listen, for the last you know 80 years, 
everybody's excuse for attacking Israel is because the poor Palestinians and they need their own state and Israel doesn't belong there in the first place and let's give it all back to the Palestinians. Now all these countries are signing on or talking about signing on to the Abraham Accords that previously took that position and they're kind of like, well, you know, yeah, we, we feel bad for the Palestinians, but, you know, we, we'll go ahead and sign anyways. Uh, Saudi's kind of holding out, but it's, it's, it's back burner is the right term. So, um, Ernie, why do you think all these countries... They're kind of like, okay, you know what? The Palestinians, yeah, but we're going to go ahead and sign the Abraham Accords with Israel. What do you think? And I don't mean from a prophetic standpoint. What do you think? Well, I, I saw a program once that said the majority of the Muslim countries don't even want Palestine involved. They don't won't let them come into their country. It's, it's actually come to that point. They don't. They don't because bad things happen. I mean, they, they actually, the Palestinians actually uh, tried to stage a revolution in Jordan uh, called Bla- it was called Black Sunday or something. Um, I can't remember the year that it was. It was a little while ago, but uh, actually, like, took up arms and attacked the government in Amman, Jordan, trying to take over their country. Like, you know, not cool, right? Uh, and there's other things that the countries are now saying about the. But what? Come on, what's the motive? One word. Somebody starts with an M. Money. Money. That's it. That's it. And that's and Kushner is a businessman, and Trump is a businessman. So this, this was their thought. Let's not try to make peace politically. Let's do this deal where you guys are going to get a lot richer. Israel's going to get richer. There's going to be security in the region, which is better for everyone's economies. And, and it's working. It works. You know, who, who would have thought, right? So uh, this article was dated, and, and you can't see because uh, it, it's so tiny. I tried to highlight it. But uh, this is dated, I think it says May 5th, 2021. So this was... Several months after the Capitol riots, Kushner actually had broken off to found the Abraham Accords Institute, which is still going strong. So just again, to make the point that Kushner, he, he, th- this, is, this is his baby, and he's not going to let it go. And he's a young man. I mean, he, he's got a long ways to go with this. Uh, oh, and can I make it? So I don't have a crystal ball. Like I said, I'm not a prophet. But can I make a prediction? Could be completely wrong. I think we're going to see Saudi Arabia join maybe in the first year of the Trump administration. I think, because Trump needs to move fast, you know, right? Because, I mean, we're going to have control of the House, the, probably the House, definitely the Senate, obviously. Um, but that might last for two years. Hey, everybody, can I, can I give you some advice? Just if you're enjoying the way things are at the moment, enjoy it. Just enjoy it, because it ain't going to last forever. The pendulum is going to swing back. We're in the end times. We are the feet of iron and clay. It's going to keep swinging back and forth. But enjoy it for now. Unless you support Kamala and then just, you know, hang in there until next time. Not being disrespectful. Anyways, so Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, and, and a lot of you have heard me uh, teach on this. Uh, this, is, this is where, for the first time in my entire life, and I haven't been on the earth for very long at all, but I've been teaching this topic now, or studying this topic for 47 years. I've been teaching it for 25 years, and, and, and I try to stay sober. I try to try to not get too out there and crazy and wild, right? You know, speculating. But for the first time in my entire life, uh, I'm seeing one person who actually might be identified in the Bible. And, and, and that's this right here. Then he, I, I legitimately think could be completely wrong. Just throw it out there. I seriously think that Jared Kushner could very well be this. He like literally mentioned the Bible. Does that sound crazy? Rex, you going to get up and leave? Are you cool? (laughs) Too crazy, Bill? I think I think the I think that he might literally be Jared Kushner. So then he shall confirm a covenant that's making a treaty with many, uh, and the many has to include Israel. So who does who does Israel need this spectacular, mind blowing treaty with the other Arab countries? And it says with many, not just one, for one week, which in the context of the seventy weeks prophecy is is a seven year period. This is actually where we get the concept of a seven year great tribulation because this treaty is the context of the seven year great tribulation. Uh, Because the primary stipulation that interests us is that when it finally gets to that point, we're like, we're like, everybody signs onto this, Syria, uh, you know, et cetera, right? Um, If Syria signs up. But anyways, when it gets to that point, that one stipulation is going to be that the Jews are allowed to rebuild their temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. um, And that is the context of this, this, this prophecy. But in the middle of the week, so the middle of a seven year period is... At the at, yeah, and you see it in the middle of my scroll there. You see the 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 temple there, the picture of the temple. That's 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 what we call what, what the Bible calls the abomination of desolation. In the middle of the week, the middle of that seven year period, 
Uh, he, and this is still referring to the original he. By the way, what what's the term, Ernie, for this he, like in the previous verse here in Daniel chapter 9, and also the terms used again in Daniel chapter 11? Prince, prince of the covenant. Okay, so what what's a prince? Here, Christine, I'll involve you. What's a prince? There you go. Or maybe in modern parlance, maybe the son-in-law of a president. Like the archangel Gabriel, when he's delivering this prophecy to Daniel, he's, he's not going to use those terms. That concept didn't exist. But son, the concept of a son existed and the concept of a king. So that's the verbiage used here. But hypothetically, it could mean a, the son-in-law of a president. Am I being too literal? I used to not be this literal, but the older I get, the more I teach this topic, I'm just getting like really literal with this stuff because that, that's how it's playing out, right? Uh, he, the prince of the covenant, might be this guy, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Where, where do sacrifice and offering? Where's the only place on earth that sacrifice and offering, because it's referring to the Jews, Gabriel said to Daniel in verse 24, this is about your people and your holy city. So where's the one place that sacrifice and offering can take place? The holy temple. Where's the holy temple? There is no holy temple. Not yet. It's got to be rebuilt. That's where the Dome of the Rock is right now in Jerusalem. That's a Muslim shrine. has to come down. So th this is not your average like peace treaty covenant. Uh, th to, to pull that off is it, going to be just so spectacularly, I, I'll work on pronouncing that, unheard of, I mean, mind-blowing, but that's the whole point of this, isn't it? It's a covenant that like no one would have ever thought of, right? But, but the prince of the covenant, if you look at the original Hebrew, he shall bring it into, it, the, the, the verb there actually um, suggests uh, by sloppiness, by carelessness, allow something to happen. So, so he, doesn't, he doesn't see what's coming. He doesn't, the, the Antichrist has signed on to this covenant. And Jared doesn't know it's the Antichrist because he's an Orthodox Jew and he doesn't believe in the Antichrist for starters, right? Yeah. And I don't think he watches our class. <laughs> I hope he does. Hey, Jared, if you're watching, love you, man. Um, <laughs> and then it says, on the wings of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. That's where we get the term abomination of desolation, which is actually used specifically like that in, in chapter 11. And then Jesus too, Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place... Uh, as spoken of by the prophet Daniel, I mean, come on, uh, even until the consummation, which is determined as put on the desolate, which is uh, basically saying that for the last three and a half years of the seven-year Great Tribulation, when the Antichrist has commandeered the Holy Temple and is ruling and reigning, and we discovered last month, studying Revelation chapter 12, he's, he's uh, killing Christians and Jews around the whole world, right? Uh, that, you know, that's, that's what this is describing here. So, so um, again, uh, this, this is describing the son of a king, or again, maybe the son-in-law of a president, maybe, in modern parlance, modern, modern speech. Um, and, and, it, and it's a covenant with many that will allow for the rebuilding of the Holy Temple. Um, so just keep watching. I mean, hist history is, is supporting this theory as of today. Okay, we'll see what happens you know, next week. But as of this moment today, couple days after the election. History is very much supporting our theory here. All right, so keep watching. Okay, any questions or comments? Everybody good? I know I spent a little bit of time on that, but I wanted to, go ahead, Wanda. Ivanka gave up Christianity for Judaism. Um, so I'm not sure that she ever considered herself a, a Christian. I know that, that President Trump kind of came into that and made that commitment in the context of him running for office the, you know, the first time. But if she did, what happens to her? Uh, let, me, let me call God on my phone and, and, I'll, and I'll see what he says. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I know that uh, the Bible is very clear, Old Testament and New Testament, that in the end all Jews will be saved. Uh -huh. uh, if, if someone, you know, does, if someone is an actual Christian, born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they convert to you. And I actually know a couple of people right here in town who have done that. Three people, I think. Um, I don't know. That's all. So uh, I'm the only pastor, teacher you guys will ever hear say those words. Let me say it again. I don't know. Become Not cool? Just through um, <laughs> but I, I, don't I don't think that he... I don't think, I don't think she ever proclaimed to be a Christian. So, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Anyways, okay, so let's get to our main uh, content here. So is this today's date? Yes, it is. Yes. Yay. 
All right, so uh, we are talking about the four horsemen of the apocalypse with the, with the overarching question, um, are we already on the timeline of, of the book of Revelation? Are we already in the book of Revelation? Um, and I know I have a slide that, uh, yeah, I mean, basically like this is the question, are, are we living in the last days, right? So, so um, we have a few new people tonight, so I'll just kind of like quickly point this out. So, so this scroll I've been working on, this timeline I've been working on for decades, you know, literally, and fine tuning it all the time. This is a, a, the latest version I printed up maybe a couple months ago. But, um, but I remain convinced that, uh, that, that we, our generation right now in 2024, uh, and this has not been true throughout history, the clock just started ticking on this timeline a couple hundred years ago. We'll talk about that. But I, I believe that today we are here. That's why I've got the red dot there that says we are here. Uh, and this is between what's called the fifth and the sixth seals on a scroll with seven seals that only Jesus can open. When the seven seals broken, that's when the great tribulation begins. Sorry, this is kind of wrinkled. We're going to work on that. Uh, that's the red line along the top is the great tribulation, abomination of desolation I was just talking about. But uh, anyway, so we're not in the great tribulation yet. But before the great tribulation can begin, here's that peace treaty, by the way. That's Daniel 9, 27 right there. That's when it's signed right there at the very, very start. Uh, but um, anyway, so we're not in the great tribulation yet. If, if I'm right, and this is where we are on the timeline, we are getting very, very close there's basically one thing left to happen before this all starts, but is it going to take a year? Is it going to be 20 years? I don't know. It feels like we're getting closer, right, Bill, like all the time? doesn't It feels like we're real close, right? 20 years does not sound right, but, you know, God knows, right? I think they work faster than they do here in the episode. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no kidding. So, um, so the first uh, four seals on the scroll with seven seals are also known as... Somebody in my class. The first four seals are also known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? So if I'm saying that we're between the fifth and sixth seals, and all this is 100% chronological, any teacher who says Revelation is not chronological, you know, you can keep listening to him if you want to. But anyways, um, but, but so that means then, according to my, my understanding of the timeline, my, my guess as to where we're at, uh, is that the four horsemen of the apocalypse are already riding. A lot of teachers teach them as part of the Great Tribulation. It's, it's just not. It, it's so clear in Revelation. That they, it's, again, it's, it's the scroll that it's God's decree of judgment on the world. Uh, it's not until the seventh seal is broken that the scroll is unfurled, and then that decree of judgment uh, begins to be carried out. That's the start of the Great Tribulation. But, um, but still, to say that, that the four horsemen of the apocalypse are riding right now, that's a big statement, isn't it? That's kind of a big thing to say. So uh, let me let me uh, continue explaining why I believe this uh, very, very strongly. Every, everybody who's in my cl class knows that uh, I am open to change my mind, and I actually do change my mind on occasion here and there about things, even to the point where I have to reprint the scroll, right? <laughs> so, so I really work hard to be intellectually honest and honest with myself and everything. The four horsemen, man, I'm, I'm sticking to my guns on, on, on this more and more all the time. Um, and let me, uh, let, and, uh, you know, again, let's, we'll continue with me explaining why. So, so this, uh, we did look at this uh, chapter last week. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but, but uh, this, is, um, this is the New King James version of the Bible. And uh, does anybody know who owns the rights to the New King James is my fa it's my favorite version. I find that I think it's closest to the original Hebrew and Greek, but at the same time, it's still in, in modern English. You know, it's not King James, you know, the and thou, right? But uh, this is, a, it's actually owned, the New King James Version is owned by Thomas Nelson Publishing. And they, yeah, it's actually copyrighted, believe it or not. So, in fact, I have to like let them know whenever I publish a book because, because that's what I quote is the New King James Version almost exclusively, a couple of exceptions, right? Uh, and then Amazon has to check with them. Hey, is this guy quoting you guys too much? And I'm like, I'm quoting God. You're going to, you know, that's not plagiarism, right? <laughs> so I always get in like just under the wire. But um, so, so uh, these headers that you see here, this is on uh, BibleGateway.com. And you'll see the same thing, these headers, uh, which don't, of course, appear in the original book of Revelation. These, this is just what Thomas Nelson has put in. Those are, and you'll see this on BibleHub.com, everywhere you see the New King James. Uh, so this is from uh, the Spirit-Filled Life Bible, which was first published in... Hey, um, our guest, 
if you want coffee, just come up here and help yourself. You're not going to disturb the class. It's fine. I might have you make me a cup while you're up here. Um, <laughs> if I run out of my Starbucks, uh, there's dessert up here, homemade dessert from Wanda. And then if you need water, I need to start bringing those in here, but you can help yourself to a bottle or those cold ones in the fridge in the front foyer. Okay. Aren't I a good host? Yeah. yeah. My wife has trained me well. So, all right. So, so again, but you know what? So these headers, again, these are put in, uh, the spirit filled life Bible first published in 1991. It's the year I moved to Arizona. And, and I love the Bible and th- this particular, you know, version, right? Um, and these seals, as it turns out, or I'm sorry, these headers, as it turns out, actually line up precisely with, with interpretation that, that I've come to as well. Okay, so, so I didn't invent what I'm, what I'm teaching. I didn't invent it. Um, I, I really always hesitate to teach anything that is completely original for me because I'm just some guy living in Lake Havre, Sioux City. Like, is it possible that God would show me something that no one's ever seen before? Sure, it's possible, but it makes me very cautious. Should make you very cautious. I, I, if I'm too innovative, you guys should think, okay, this guy might be a little, my father-in-law squinting his eyes at me. Like, yeah, dude, I know you. So, so um, hey, Ben, what am I studying right now? My pile of books on the, uh, just, say, just say the word, the people, the name of the people. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that, close enough. Okay. And um, wasn't I so excited the other day because after like 20 books and months of research, I finally found one sentence backing up my crazy theory. Anyways, right? It's true. It's true. It's like, thank God. I, I had to go all the way back to 1841 to find it, but it's, it's super helpful. Anyways, okay, so, uh, so, so Thomas Nelson says that the first seal uh, is, is the conqueror. It, it symbolizes, in a sense, conquering. The second seal is conflict on earth, or the simple word for that is war. Uh, the third is scarcity on earth, and we might think of famine, but it's a little bit more complicated than that, slightly more complicated. And then the fourth, they, they determined, they decided, uh, is just you know widespread death in general by various means, by war, famine, disease, you know, et cetera, right? So, um, so and again, you know, this is, this per, pretty much precisely matches like what I write in part one of my book series. So super happy. I didn't invent it. I'm not the first one to come up with this, with this, uh, in, you know, interpretation. Um, that said, hold on, let me get back here. Okay. So that said, uh, we're going to, so, okay. So what are the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Look, last class, I told you, Don, so I've told you guys what they are, yeah. right? So it's, it's the, this concept of conquering, like one nation conquering another, followed by war, followed by scarcity on earth. Okay, the, the term I am going with is economic disparity. Does it just mean there's famine? It means that there's a lot of poor people and a lot of rich people. Okay, that's, that's, that's more precisely what, it, what it's described. Followed by just death by all this stuff, like the earth is just kind of falling apart, things are not as good as they might seem if you're in like Havasu drinking Starbucks like me most of the time. Right. Um, so, so we, so we have the overview. That's, that's what we're going with. Again, my interpretation, Thomas, um, I, I am going to share this article with you from, uh, Wikipedia that, um, that kind of, kind of, uh, kind of, um, supports this point I'm making that this is, this is not the only possible interpretation of the four horsemen. You guys, if you've, if you've been in this topic at all before coming to my class, you've heard a bunch of different interpretations of the four horsemen. And uh, just to go over it briefly, so the four horsemen of the, of the apocalypse. Okay, so j- just, just to look at the first one, we're not going to look at all three, but, um, but the first one is a white horse, right? So it's a white horse followed by a red horse followed by a black horse followed by a pale horse. Uh, just, just to look at the white horse for an example, in some... In some interpretations, uh, going back over the last 2,000 years or modern times or whatever, um, some see the white horse as symbolizing Jesus himself or the gospel or the Holy Spirit. I don't know why that won't hold my highlight. Uh, others interpret the white horse to be the Antichrist. So right off the bat, this is Wikipedia, so this, this is showing like the major theories. Right off, you, did you catch that? Yeah. Right off the bat, we see two entirely opposite interpretations of the white horse. Okay, that makes it challenging for us, right? And and uh, Wikipedia, they're they're quoting like you know actual, you know guys with credentials, highly respected, right? So how on earth are we going to find the right answer if right off the bat, right? Other interpretations include the Roman Empire, in general, and there's a reason for that. Uh, some say that the white horse represents war. 
Others say it's an infectious disease. Uh, and these, these are just like some of the main ones that are out there. So, so depending on who you're, how, who you're listening to, you'll listen, you'll hear like a whole wide range of just on the first horse, not to mention the other three, right? And again, most end times teachers say that the four horsemen are part of the great tribulation. So according to that model, they, they haven't, they're not even riding yet, right? Then this is what's fun for us. If, if we're right, if I'm right, we, if you guys are tracking with me here, that the four horsemen are already riding again, what does that mean for us? That means that we're finally, after 2000 years, we're on the timeline. We are actually in the book of revelation, us sitting in here. Uh, that means the clock is ticking. It means that all this stuff is going to, going to continue to play out. And if we study this and understand it, then we know what to watch for. What's the next thing to be watching for? Then what's going to happen next? And then we're prepared for it. Does God want us to know what's coming so that we're prepared? What, what do you think that? I mean, doesn't he just want us to be surprised or? He's showing us, like, if you really, you know, you're spiritual and you really believe with everything that's in the Bible, you can see all of these miraculous things that are happening. Yeah, I, I love what you just said. So Christine is my new favorite student. So student. <laughs> You're, you're new. I won't call you student, but yeah, participant. Um, yeah, I know. I love that. That's that's an excellent answer. So what I think I heard you say is that uh, we are actually seeing a lot of these things playing out already. And if if so, if we know what signs to watch for, uh, and if we're seeing them happen, and they're happening like the Bible says and in the right order, that that should be a really big, you know, strong clue to us, right? So so then we're prepared. We know. So so the big clue to us is it's in God's word. And we know that the entire Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, every book of the Bible touches on the end times. In the Old Testament, there were a bunch of prophecies about Jesus' first coming. Uh, that was only 20%. 80% of the prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament are about his second coming. Jesus' final parting words to his disciples, his last sermon before he went to the cross, was the Olivet Discourse. It was his second longest sermon he ever taught that we have on record next to the Sermon on the Mount. And that was all about the end times. And what's God's final parting written word to mankind? It's this. It's the book of Revelation, 22 chapters, all about the end times. So does that, does that tell us that God wants us to know about this stuff? He wants us to know what's going to happen, right? So this is why it's fun. Like, like if, we can, if we can find convincing evidence that the four horsemen are riding, that should make us kind of excited. You know, and, and, you know, yeah, it's, it's like, oh gosh, that means that the bad stuff's really going to start soon, but then we're ready. Hosea four, six, my people perish for lack of knowledge, right? I'm not going to get into all that. I've, I've preached on this before my soapbox. We need to know what's coming. Okay. And a lot, so many Christians just don't want to know cause it's scary. Right. So, um, uh, the Wikipedia article, there was just another little section I wanted to share real briefly just to just to finish this point. So um, different interpretations of the four horsemen in general, the Christological interpretation, again, that, that the four horsemen rec represent Jesus, the prophetic interpretation, which is actually along the lines of how we're interpreting it, which is, well, this is describing future events, right? As we get close to the great tribulation, uh, there's the historicist, historicist interpretation. This all happened already. The preterist interpretation kind of the same concept that, that this is all describing events that happened 2000 years ago when the Romans came in and destroyed, you know, Jerusalem. Uh, that's a really popular one, preterism. And yeah, not true. Uh, the latter day saint interpretation, Ernie, didn't you convert to Mormonism recently? Okay, good. So I won't offend anybody. Yeah. So, so that's, that's what the Mormons say, uh, about the four horsemen. And then there's a bunch of other ones, right? So, okay. So you guys get the point. Um, so, so, so how can we say what the horsemen are, what they represent, et cetera? Well, we're going to talk about it. So, um, so this was fun. So a, a few weeks ago when I was working on, you know, this part of our topic, I just typed into Google. This is, you know, a couple weeks ago, right? What are the four horsemen of the apocalypse? And I don't know if that's too tiny for you to see, but that's why I typed in. What are the four horsemen of the apocalypse? And I was so happy and encouraged because Google agrees with this, whatever that means, Right. Uh, the four horsemen are, and they, they have it backwards here, so I'm going to read backwards. Conquest, war, famine, and death. That's exactly how we're interpreting it, okay? So that was cool. And um, most encouraging of all, uh, 25 years ago when I started writing part one of my book series, it takes me a long time to write, a lot of research. Oh, Ben, go ahead.
Oh, is it cutting out? Oh, brother. Well, just hang with it. Do the best you can. and, and Okay. Oh, bummer. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll and we'll check it. I'll call our internet we'll provider we'll, about that. Yeah, we'll okay. I, I have a thumb drive, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk after. Okay. So that, that's fine. No worries. Um, and everybody can, you know, watch it later. So, uh, okay. So what I was saying is that, um, also very encouraging to me is 20, 25 years ago when I was writing about the four horsemen and, and laying out my, um, again, it, it, it kind of caused me pause and made me kind of, you know, apprehensive to, to write how I was seeing it. Um, because at that time I'd go on the internet and I'd search and I couldn't find, you know, anybody who was, who was interpreting the four horsemen like that. Now, if you, if you type what I typed right there, uh, there's a lot of teachers out there that are going along with this exact interpretation. It means conquest, war, uh, famine, and just death in, in general. Okay. So that's helpful. Um, so, um, what, where do you think we might be able to, or what, what might we do to try to get more insight in, into the four horsemen just, just to start to kind of let us, you know, hone in on what, uh, home in on what, um, what we're looking for here. How about the word? We'll do, we'll look at the actual Bible, right? So, so, uh, most people are not aware of this, but, uh, but the book of revelation is not the only place where the, where these four colored horses show up. Okay. Uh, very interesting. And listen, um, here's, here's, you know, you know, some, some advice as you're studying the book of revelation in particular, uh, the key to the whole book of revelation is the whole rest of the word of God, old Testament and new and probably new, um, old Testament more than new, but it's both, you, you know, you have both. So, you, you know, today we live in the day of the internet, you can, or, you know, computers, your phone, you can easily cross reference, you know, scripture to, to find the answers, find clues to things. Right. So, um, so, so in fact, the first time that we see this, this concept of, of the four horsemen, generally speaking, is way back in the old Testament in the bat, the book of Zechariah. So, so, uh, just to give some context, Zechariah was, are you guys okay so far? I know this is kind of like, you know, gets me with my nuts and bolts, but it's, it's very important. So you doing okay, Wanda? And then good. Okay. So, uh, so Zechariah chapter six, verses one through seven, the book of Zechariah was written around the year 538 BC. So this coincides with, um, so, so where, where were the Jews in uh, around that time in the sixth century? Do you guys remember? It's, it's important. It's pertinent. Okay. So what happened in 586 BC, Ernie? Yeah. So 586 BC, the Babylonians came in. And they destroyed the temple, King Solomon's temple, the first temple, and they took a million Jews captive into Babylon, okay? And the book of Isaiah prophesied that they would be in, in, in captivity, estranged from God, in essence, for 70 years, okay? So if you count from 586, 70 years forward, you land on uh, 516 B.C. It's B.C., so we're counting backwards, right? And, um, and, and uh, what happened in 516 B.C. is that that temple that was destroyed— in 586 BC, 70 years earlier, it was the, the second temple was, was dedicated in the year 516, seven, seven years later. The second temple was built by a guy named Zerubbabel. So have you guys ever heard of Ezra? Yes. Have you ever heard of Nehemiah? Yes. Nobody ever hears of Zerubbabel. It's kind of a, you know, he's, he's in the Bible, but you got to kind of dig for him. But um, he, he was the one who led the first group of Jews back to Jerusalem by permission to rebuild the temple. So this guy had an incredibly important job. Okay. But, uh, but that's when Zechariah wrote his book was, was right when Zerubbabel was gathering together his group of Jews who would go back with him to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. So, so Israel, the nation has been destroyed, but God is just getting ready to restore it. And then it would last for another, you know, half a millennium before it was, you know, destroyed again. So, so, so you guys good, you get the context. So this is, this is right around the time that, um, that the, that the first wave of Jews are going back to Jerusalem to rebuild. And this is where we get, okay, watch this. So Zechariah chapter six, verses one through seven, uh, Zechariah has a vision of four chariots. Okay. 
So let's go ahead and read it. Then I, Zechariah, turned and raised my eyes and looked, and behold, four chariots were coming from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. So this is a, a spiritual vision. Uh, do I need to zoom in? You want me to zoom in? You, you can read okay? Okay. You know what? I'm going to zoom in just a little bit, even though you said it's okay. It feels small to me. There we go. That's better. Okay. Um, so this this is this is a spiritual vision. He's seeing something in the in, in the spirit, just like John when he you know penned the book of Revelation, right? And and remember what we're looking for here. We're looking for clues about how to properly interpret the four horsemen. We need to know what these guys are before we can start saying, oh yeah, it's already happening. You know, isn't this exciting? Um, so this, this Zechariah is going to help us. Okay. So he says in verse two, with the first chariot were red horses. There's our red horses. With the second chariot, black horses. With the third chariot, white horses, and with the fourth chariot, dappled horses, strong steeds. Then I answered, what are these, my Lord? So um, d- does anybody at first glance see see the similarity between this and our four horsemen in Revelation? Okay, and but what are the differences? There's the order, for one thing. Very, very good. So the order, and then there's one other difference. So... Well, so you remember in, Re- in Revelation that the fourth horse is, is a pale horse. This is saying a dappled horse. So what's the difference between pale and dappled? So, so, so the good news is actually kind of none. So if you search for dappled horse on Google, it includes pictures of guys like this. So it, it, it's the same thing. We're getting the exact same four colors, just to make that clear. It's, it's just the same thing. It's a pale horse. That's what a dappled horse is. It's, it's a pale horse, okay? So, so that helps us. So we're not getting like two, you know, okay, we've got three, but one is, you know, off, right? But the order is definitely different. And also, this description here, you'll, you'll notice a difference. And the angel answered and said to me, these are four spirits of heaven who go out from their station. So, so pause right there. So this is something that we don't get in Revelation. This, this helps us. These are what now? Was it say in verse 5? They're spirits of heaven, so they're not evil spirits, okay? They're not, they're not you know, fallen angels or whatever. They're, they are spirits, so we know that now. That's huge, that bit of information. It's, it's a spiritual force coming from heaven, and look what it says, who go out from their station before the Lord of all the earth, okay? So this means, see, again, see what I'm saying here? This is information we don't get from Revelation, but cross-referencing back to Zechariah, it's like, oh, okay, this gives us more clues as to what these things are. So these are actual, um, these are, these are, this is phenomena that's, that's being carried out in the spirit sent from God himself. It's, it's God who orchestrates us. And listen, I'll, I'll tell you something. I've said this before, make no mistake. Everything that happens on the, the entire timeline of the book of revelation, it's, it's God who's orchestrating it. This is his plan. He's not caught by su- surprise. He's allowing things to happen that are not his will, like, like the antichrist taking over the temple. Okay, and yet it is his will because that's the pretext for God finally kicking Satan out of heaven. We looked at that in Revelation chapter 12. And, and then finally Satan's, you know, rule over this earth is going to come to an end because of that. So, but, uh, but the great tribulation, we talked about this before, it begins, it's God's hand, God himself who starts the seven-year great tribulation. Okay, and you guys all know I teach a post-tribulation rapture. So that, that's a terrible thought that I'm saying God who loves us, we're born again, we're his children, that he's the one who does all this stuff. And, you know, we're here for it, but we've talked about that before. He supernaturally protects us, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to open that can of worms. I, I, whenever we have new people, I start thinking, well, I got to mention this and this, and this. I'm going to try to control myself. You talk to me after class or whatever. And if you guys read, uh, I'll give you a copy of my book as a free gift. You know, if you want to read my books, uh, just see me after class. Um, okay. So these are, this is, this is phenomena that is carried out by angelic forces. It, it's sent by God himself. We see this. So verse six, uh, the one with the black horses is going to the north country. The white are going after them. So again, we're seeing definitely they're riding out in different order than we see in Revelation. And the dappled are going toward, or pale, are going toward the south country. And the strong steeds went out eager to go that they might walk to and fro on the earth. And he said, "Go." actually, let me back up a little bit. I want to point out one other thing. Um, notice, too, that, that it's not riders in this case, like someone riding on the back of one horse. It's chariots here that are being pulled by a team of horses. 
You see that? Okay. Uh, how pertinent is that? I don't know, but just to point that out, there are, there are, you know, some differences here, the order, uh, w how that helps us a little bit seeing that is, and we'll see it in a minute. Uh, these horses here, uh, represent different things. And in revelation, I'll, I'll explain in a second. I'm, I don't want to get ahead of myself. So, but, uh, this, okay. So th here, here comes another clue. You ready for another clue? Okay. You see this though. The black are going to the North country, the white after them dappled toward the South country. Uh, it doesn't even mention the red horses again. There's a reason for that. Uh, then the strong steeds went out eager to go that they might walk to and fro. What do you see there? This is another clue about these guys. Okay. Throughout the earth. And he said, go walk to and fro throughout the earth. Or we might even like, 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 like add to this a little bit throughout the whole earth is what God means. Right. Say again. Well, this is, this is, this is one of our biggest clues here about what the four horsemen are. And, and I'll explain in one second what I'm getting at here. So they walk to and fro throughout the earth. Three times we see this at the end of this, this passage in Zechariah, uh, throughout the earth, uh, throughout the earth, throughout the earth. Okay. So it's, it's really emphasized. This is a ready drum roll global phenomena that's happening. This is not, this is not, you know, contained or, or just, just, you know, one incident or whatever. Um, now, why is that helpful to us as we try to understand the four horsemen, in the book of revelation? Uh, that's, that, that's easy to answer. Okay. If, if this, if we're supposed to be able to look at this and understand, so Christina, I, I, I'm, I'm on your side. I think that God wants us to understand this stuff. How can I see this thing that symbolizes one country conquering another when that's been happening since the beginning of human civilization? Think of Genghis Khan, think of Alexander the Great, et cetera, et cetera. This has been going on since the beginning of, of, of human history, right? One, you know, nations conquering other nations. Uh, okay. And then the second horse in Revelation represents war. Well, wars have been happening since Cain murdered Abel, right? That's another thing. This, this doesn't help us at all, God. You know, why do you even bother putting this in writing? This is right. Uh, the third one, scarcity on earth. Is that a new phenomenon or has that always happened? There's the Bible over and over. We see stories of famine and, you know, a famine hits Egypt or it's, you know, hits up in the Holy Land. So Jacob and his sons have to come down to Egypt, Joseph, right? So, so that doesn't help us either. You know, God, you know, what, what, what are you trying to tell us here? Right. And then finally just widespread death in general. Yeah. Famine, disease, war, whatever. Uh, so the, the, these phenomena that the four horsemen in revelation are describing, um, it's happened throughout history. So, so, but what's different this time around? What, what's, what's the one thing where we're, we can look, we should be able to look at the four horsemen and say, these, this is the only thing in history that qualifies. There's, there's, there's been no other time in history where these four horsemen global. took place. It's that's what we get from Zechariah. It's got to be global. So, so, um, what did, what did global mean in the time of Zechariah? See, because when God talks about the whole world, we think, cause you know, it's logical. We think of the whole globe. So you got, you know, four oceans and seven continents and it's the whole planet. Say, say again. They didn't know. And also God, God's concern with all this stuff. It's about the story of mankind. So human civilization. Now I know that there were like, you know, native Americans and stuff, but the ones who are involved in this story that's been playing out over the last 6,000 years, let's say, right. Uh, th that's God's concern. When he talks about the world, he means the world of men. He means the world of human civilization. So, so Zachariah is describing something here that in the context of his time, 1500 years ago, I'm sorry, 2,500 years ago in the cut. Yeah, go ahead, Ben. Restart the, the TikTok stream. It's about to go dead. Oh yeah. Thank you. Is that what that noise meant? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I said the time, I Good call. Said, I started setting the timer. Uh, oh, that was your timer. Okay. Um, it's about to it's, go dead. It's, maybe? yeah, it's still, it's still going. So just, oh, okay. I'll watch for it though. Thank you. If you don't see me walk over there and press my phone, just uh, remind me again. Yes, uh, sorry. Yeah. We try to do TikTok. That's like my biggest online audience. So, um, got to restart that. And I think TikTok, TikTok is actually working on like apparently our other, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. all right. Yeah. So, um, okay. so, uh, hold on one second. Yes. So, so this concept of the earth, it means the world of men. It means, it means human civilization. So that was a distinction in, in Zachariah's time. And, and I, I, I won't claim to um, have a solid position on this myself. 
at this point because it's just one of those things that's like like on my list like I need to like dig in further and you know if I need to come up with you know what's what's my best theory doesn't mean my stuff is right but I, I really work hard to make everything fit but if you go to biblehub.com there's a lot of different commentaries on various passages and I actually uh, read through these just in preparation for this class and uh, and I like this one, Benson commentary. So let me let me read this. I like I like his idea. I think he might be onto something. So here's what here's what Benson says. Whoever Benson is, he says in the first chariot were red horses. This meant the Chaldean Empire, which is or it might be pronounced Chaldean. I'm not sure. Uh, which is what Ernie? Babylon. 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 So I like his thinking right off the bat because. Because again, where, where is Zechariah at this time? He's in he's in Babylon, which at this time had, is just now switching from the Babylonian Empire to the Ernie Ben. Come on, oh, it's switching from Babylonian to the uh, to the Roman Persian. No. Uh, Persian, the Medo Persian Empire. Okay, so so that would that would kind of make sense if he's interpreting this right. Uh, hold on one sec. I'm gonna zoom in on this too. Okay, this meant the, the, the Babylonian Empire, the bloody cruelties of which were signified by the red color of the horses. Eh, okay, I'll go along with that. I think this empire being overthrown and its power extinct, which is precisely when Zechariah had this vision, he says, it, it, that's correct. It is only mentioned by the by for the sake of order and nothing further is said of it. So not sure if you caught that, but, but in Zechariah, he mentioned the red horses, but then, when, but then down below when he talks about where they go, he says, you know, two go toward the north country, one goes toward the south, the red is left out. Because when Zechariah had this vision, the Babylon, Babylonian Empire in that moment was, was defunct. They were, they were over, okay? Uh, so Benson says, um, and in the second, black horses, we find, the, we find by the apocalypse, so here he, he's cross-referencing the other direction, that's cool, uh, that a black horse, which I think is, you know, reasonable, that the black horse was an emblem of famine or, or dearth. Okay, that means famine, I think. Uh, so that the chariot with black horses seems to signify the Persian Empire, which was the one that had just taken over when Zechariah had this vision, right? They're the ones who sent Zer Zerubbabel back, and then later Ezra, and then finally Nehemiah, right? Which brought desolation on many countries, as appears in the history of Darius and Xerxes. And in the third chariot, white horses conquerors you used to ride on white horses when they were triumphing. So, so we still have the conquering concept. Triumphing on account of victories gained over their enemies. This therefore aptly denoted the most continual victories of Alexander. Who's that? Alexander the Great. Which is which empire? Greece. The Greeks, which fall, immediately followed the Persian Empire as the global hegemon, right? Uh, remember, this is all from uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel chapter 2, the, the, the big statue. Who, in a few years, overturned the Persian Empire and set up the Macedonian, that's the Greek Empire, right? And in the fourth chariot, representing the Roman Empire. See, and what, the other thing I like about this is, again, this, this follows precisely the, the statue in King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, right? The head of gold and the, and the chest and shoulders of silver, abdomen of, of bronze, legs of iron, and then feet of iron and clay. Because remember, we talked about that quite a bit before, right? Uh, and then he says, representing the Roman Empire, grizzled and bay horses, pale horses, denoting the various forms of the Roman government. So again, um, I, I just like at first glance, just to be able to like kind of throw something out here for us to, to help us figure out our four horsemen, the ones in Revelation, I, I'm digging what this guy says. I, I, it, it seems super reasonable and lines up with other things we see in scripture. So, 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 so how does this really help us though, Wanda, if like the four horsemen, when Zacharias saw them, were representing these different empires, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, and then finally the Romans. It's very different here, okay, but what's, what's the same is that they are phenomena that God himself orchestrates. He sends these guys out from heaven, and they're to carry out the, uh, or, or, or perpetuate certain phenomena here on earth, throughout the entire earth. It's global. Is that, is that good enough? Uh -huh. I know it's a little bit muddied. I'm going to work on this. When I teach this again in 10 years, Jesus will be back by then. But, you know, he'll teach it. He'll teach it. He'll teach but, it. Um, but, but good enough. So from Zechariah, we at least get that. It's, it's sent by God. God is causing and it's And it's for, for what purpose? It's for the world to go in the direction that God intends. Make no mistake. This is his story. 
uh, right? The word history that, you know, if you break down, this isn't for real, but you know, his story, right? History. Uh, and, and, uh, he's the one who orchestrates the direction that things go. That's, that's always been true. Okay. So, um, for, for us, okay. This word starts to get fun, funner. It's already been fun, right? It's already been fun, right? You having fun? Okay, good. Cause I'm having fun. Okay. So, um, so now check this out. Okay. Uh, if this is true, what we're saying here, and th- this part's obvious, right? The four horsemen, that's the beginning of the end time story. Uh, it's the seven se- They're part of the seven seals. This is, this is the stuff that happens before, before the great tribulation actually starts. Right. So, so, uh, uh, what, what, what were we talking about before? Oh, there it goes right there. Bear with me. You know what? I should train my father-in-law who's sitting right here to, uh, to do this stuff here, go live again. And there we go. Okay. Come on two, three. I mean, three, two, one. There we are. Yay. Okay. Welcome back everybody. Sorry about that. Okay. So, um, so again, does Jesus ever talk about the end times? Yeah. I mean, big time, right? So what, what's the name of that sermon where we find Jesus teachings about the end times? I'll give you a hint. He taught it on the Mount of Olives right before he went to the cross. So the Olivet Discourse, right? So it's Matthew chapter 24. It's really 24 and 25. But, um, but, but, the, but only part of that is, is the actual chronology of the end times. We see the word then used, I think, 19 times altogether in, in, in this one passage. Uh, and it's actually from Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 31. So it's not a, a lot of verses there. But Jesus gives a very brief synopsis of, of the whole end time story. Every, you know, in essence, everything that you see in front of you here, he just does it in just a few verses, right? So um, does anyone remember where in the all of the discourse Jesus actually starts talking about the seven year great tribulation? Does anyone remember? Okay, I mentioned it earlier. Bear with me, everybody. Come on, hang in there. <laughs> We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 14. In verse 15, that's where we're in the great tribulation in Jesus' narrative. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. So when, when Jesus finally, in his narrative about the end times, when he finally gets to the great tribulation, he's actually right in the middle of that seven-year period. Okay, that's, that's, that's his concern. He kind of he leaves out the first three and a half, you know, strangely enough. But um, so what that means then is that what you see on my screen there. Matthew 24, verses 1 through 14. This is Jesus' description of everything that will happen leading up to the seven-year Great Tribulation. Again, it should be something that, that, that makes sense to us that we can distinguish from any other time in human history. We should be able to read it and say, oh my gosh, that's us. This isn't 500 years ago. This isn't, you know, back in the 1800s. This is, this is our time, right? So, uh, so let's, let's take a look at that. Let's see what Jesus, what Jesus says about about the events and conditions leading up up to the seven year great tribulation, which um, just to make sure we're clear, I want this to be clear. So uh, verses four through fourteen of Matthew chapter twenty four, the all the discourse, verses four through fourteen. That's our orange line up here. Okay, uh, verses four through fourteen are in essence the seven seals. Okay, so uh, so that means that not only are we right around uh, Revelation chapter 6, us right now in the year 2024, but we are also in Jesus' own words in Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 14. That's kind of cool, right? So so these verses, these cover the set, the period of the seven seals, which I say we're in the middle of right now. Good enough? Okay, so I got, I'm going to take a quick drink. So here we go. All right. So 1 through 14, uh, this is the all of it discourse. By far the most important, pertinent, relevant, end times passage in the entire Bible. Uh, and with apologies to John the Apostle, who did a lot of work writing all this, but still, this is, this is our main go-to for the end times. Hold on. Zoom in. So uh, verse 1, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his di- disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple, And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. 
Um, so wh- where are we now in the timeline of Jesus' life here on earth? What, what moment is this? You guys remember? Yeah, go ahead, Bill. This, that's in that passage, 100%. Yeah, but you're, but you're saying us. Right. Yeah. Well, there again, though. In this, in that sermon. Yeah. And right, and this, this is actually, yeah, this is called the All of It Discourse. Yeah, the Sermon on the Mount was like, you know, earlier in his ministry. But um, yeah, and there again, I would say, well, hasn't there always been wars and rumors of wars? Yeah. But there, so there has to be something distinct here where we could look at it and say, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. That that's. That's the end times. It's not wars and rumors of wars like it's been for the last 6,000 years. It, it's something different. There's something distinct. Go ahead, Bill. Isn't that what all the horses are about? To and fro over the earth all this time? Exactly. The wars and rumors of wars because they're talking about, they're talking about the different time on the timeline. Right. The wars we've had and everything. Mm-hmm. And then the horses have been trotting around for a long time. Yeah. For thousands of years. Yeah, thousands of years. So, so how can we tell like what distinguishes the four horsemen and yeah one of the one of the big characteristics is that it's got to be a global phenomenon okay so remember in the context of uh Zachariah's time you know you had these huge empires that were going out and basically conquering the entire known world okay uh but then when we get to the book of revelation now we're in a completely different period in human history where now the world or the whole earth literally means the whole world and the whole earth right Except Antarctica, maybe, but I don't. You know, there's penguins down there, but right. I mean, now, now it literally is the entire planet, and 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 so these things, like Zachariah, the things he described. Yeah, we did see conquest over the whole world of of, of human civilization back then, right? We did see war over that whole area. The Babylonians coming in, the Medo Persians, the Romans. My gosh, right? Uh, but the scale that the Book of Revelation is depicting. When, when, when we say worldwide in the book of Revelation, by the time we get to our time, that means something completely different. That's not just, so, you know, like Russia right now, they have a big chunk of land. Now they're trying to steal, you know, swaths of land from Ukraine. That, that It's not what we're talking about. When we say worldwide now, it's literally the entire planet. So have we ever seen any phenomenon on planet Earth where the entire planet is victimized by this this? phenomenon of, of conquest. Okay. A nation. Okay. You're getting there. Cause see, you, you know, you already know, we already know the red horse, the second horse that symbolizes war. So that would be a question for that too. Do we know of anything in all of human history where we could legitimately say the entire planet earth is at war? What'd you, what'd you say, Bill? World war one and world war two. So there's some, there's some low hanging fruit. Cause there was more, there was more, Nations fighting each other. Well, so, and I'm a poli sci geek, okay, so that, that was my education in college and grad school. And what we talked about there is that there was no World War I and World War II. They were the same war. World War II was just part two of World War I. And, um, and, and, you know, and then even today, okay, well, those wars ended. Uh, that's act- actually not even remotely true. We've been at war the entire planet ever since the beginning of World War I. It hasn't stopped. And I'm going to explain that. Okay, I'm going to qualify that. Uh, but, but, but so you're getting the hang of this, right? Like, like how we're going to figure out this puzzle. Are we really in the time of the four horsemen? Are these four things literally global right now? Um, and in fact, um, before we go through Jesus' words, I think it would be useful to just, I'm going to back up a little bit here because, and this is, this is actually our cliffhanger for tonight, but we're going to go back and take just a few minutes and read through what Jesus said, but this is actually going to be our cliffhanger. So, 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 so we know now what we're looking, what are we looking for? What are we looking for? We want to see if we can for real identify the four horsemen, okay, in our time. Uh, they're unprecedented. It's something that's unprecedented in human history, right? It's, it, we, it was never seen before whatever we land on here, right? Uh, global in scale, and not just one or two of them, but all four have to be completely global in scale. Talk about unprecedented. I mean, one is enough to be like, wow, that's interesting. Four, right? Uh, one horseman naturally follows the other, meaning that, you know, they're not just all jumbled up. I mean, literally, first the white horse sets out, and then that naturally leads. You know you know where, I, where this model, like, came to me, like where it jumped out of me? Not sitting in a Bible class, not reading the Bible, not praying. This is terrible. Sitting in a secular college in Tucson, Arizona, listening to my 
uh, Marxist professor talk seriously. And I'm like, I can't believe what I'm seeing here. This is the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And it was, I'm talking about a you know, four year vacation or vacation. Yeah. It wasn't vacation, four year education there. And then another two years in grad school down in Phoenix. And this, this, this was my, my major, you know, right. World history and international relations and all that. Uh, this is where I, this is where I got this and it came to me very exciting. It was kind of a slow burn leading up. And it's like, you know, wow. Anyways. Uh, and then also finally, so one naturally leads to the other. So, so it's not just that, you know, the, this conquest concept happens and then, it, you know, you just, you know, happen to have, you know, world war after that. And then you just happen. It's, it's literally the one automatically leads to the next. It's, it's inevitable. Okay. It was inevitable. It's inevitable that the red horse will follow the white horse. It is inevitable. This is, this is secular scholarship I'm talking about here. Inevitable that the black horse would follow the red horse. And it's inevitable that the pale horse would follow the black horse. This is, this is the secular world saying this, having no clue what the Bible says. And I'm, I'm, li- I'm like learning this in college. I'm like, oh my gosh, right? It's like, you know, this is my thing, the book of Revelation, since I was 10 years old. I'm the biggest geek you'll ever meet, but you wouldn't get that impression looking at me, right? I look, okay, Christina looks skeptical. All right. <laughs> and then finally, uh, once, once a horseman sets out, this is very important, it continues riding, okay? It never stops until Jesus comes back. And that was one of my updates to, to my uh, timeline is, is I used to just have the four horsemen way, see him way down there, point to it, Wanda, way down there, the horses, okay? I used to just kind of have them on there, but now you might notice I have a, an arrow in front of him that goes all the way, and then the seven trumpets sound, those keep sounding, all the, and then the bowl judgments toward the end of the Great Tribulation, and, and you have, you have um, all 21 of these things doing their thing nonstop, relentlessly, all the way to the very end when Jesus finally comes back. So that, that means then what we're going to, what we're going to, you know, discover about the four horsemen that we're in the middle of all four of them right now. Okay. Not only have they already set out, but we're living in that world right now. We may not see it because we're like in it, right? You can't see the forest for the trees, right? So, so this is, this is what we'll be looking for. Um, I'm going to end tonight's class just with Jesus' own words about this period that we're in right now, okay? I have so much fun with this stuff. Such a geek, okay. <laughs> so, um, so this is, this, so I asked before, what is this moment in history? This is, this is literally hours before Jesus got arrested and went to the cross, okay? So again, this is his last sermon he's ever going to give. He's just with his 12 disciples, so it's not a big crowd of people, but it's his, it's his guys. Like these are the 12, not including Judas, of course, but these are the 12 that are going to, I'm going to be crucified and then 40 days later ascend to the Father. These are the guys that are going to go out into the whole world and bring this message, this gospel to the whole world. And this is what I want to leave them with. These are my last words to these guys, my parting words. Now he sees them again during the 40 days when he's on earth once, you know, here and there. I don't know where he was. Like the first thing I'm going to ask him when he gets back, dude, where were you that whole 40, right? We know he showed up, you know, he's on the beach cooking fish. And, and he said a few things, you know, Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. But he never gave another sermon. This is serious. Okay. And um, so does anyone in here, have you ever met a disciple of Christ? Yes. Okay. Don, he fell. He, yeah. He didn't fall for my trick. I do a lot of trick questions. Yeah. You're looking at one and I'm looking at a bunch right here. We're all disciples of Christ. So if this is a message to his disciples, this is by extension, a message to us. And of course it is because everything that Jesus is about to tell them didn't happen to them. Okay. It's, but it's going to happen to us. We're the generation that all this is, is, is happening to even now. Okay. Uh, and, and they're, and they're on the Mount of, or I'm sorry, they're not on the Mount of Olives yet, but, but they're at the temple and Jesus points to all the buildings on the temple. Not one stone um, shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And the, the, the you know, four times so far I visited it, uh, Israel. And Ben, you remember this, right? Uh, if you go to the Temple Mount today and you visit the southwest corner of the Temple Mount right here, you'll see, you'll see a big pile of a bunch of big giant boulders. And this is actually the remains of the temple, the buildings that were on the Temple Mount, not the temple itself. There are some chunks of that left somewhere, right? But um, but these were the these are the this is the remains of the building. So so this happened uh, about thirty nine years. I'm sorry, not thirty nine years. Uh, da da da. Yeah, thirty nine years uh, after Jesus spoke these words that the Romans came in in AD seventy, and this and it actually took place. His prophecy, 
Not one stone left here upon another. They, they were all thrown down off the Temple Mount. And here's what they look like today. Ben, you remember that? Yeah, how how did we get there? Do you remember? Uh, the sign that said, do not enter. No, nobody, nobody ever has visited this spot except for the archaeologist there. Yeah, so we hired a local archaeologist, the most famous archaeologist, real young guy, but uh, but he actually took us up underground to the base of the Temple Mount, the southwest corner, and then and then there was this ladder, and we poked our heads out of the ladder, and there there's where we came out, like you know, right here. So. That was kind of cool. And somewhere in Ben's stash, he's got a rock from underneath this spot here. Right, Ben? You have, you, have a, you have a rock from underneath this spot here? Yes. Which may or may not have been legal, but, you know, customs didn't stop us. So why did I just say that online? Are we still online? No. Okay. All right. So uh, back to Jesus. All right. So, uh, so um, now they move from there to the Mount of Olives, and it says, Now as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. So remember, it's just them saying, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming? What they're referring to, the second coming. Because he's told them about that, right? I'm going to leave and I'm going to come back. And the end of the age. So they understand that the second coming will happen at the end of this current age of, of human history, of mankind, right? Why is that coming up? And Jesus answered and said, take heed that no one deceive you. Uh, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And Ernie always makes the point that that means coming on like the, 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 um, in the name of Jesus or the authority, like claiming the authority. And Jesus is warning about that. Yes, it's, of course it's Christians because non-Christians don't come claiming the authority of Jesus. So, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not naming names, but Jesus himself is saying, and this is especially true in the last of the last days, which is us right now, watch out for false teachers. I swear I'm not one. You can, you can hang out with me. So, yeah. No, I, I work hard. Holy Spirit, help me. Okay. Uh, verse 6, and, you, and here you go, Bill. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And the end, he is referring to the seven-year Great Tribulation. We're almost done. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Again, this has happened throughout history, but what's the distinction here? What's going to be different in the last of the last days, the time that we're in now? That it will be global in scale. That's, that's the one main distinction, okay? And there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. You know, you know something else um, that we might suspect, like if we really did the work on this, you know that I have, um, that, that we might also expect, like if we look back at trend lines and statistics and charts and graphs and actual numbers, because all this stuff has been you know, studied in, in our time, right? Uh, maybe we might even expect to see like trends, like all these things that Jesus is naming, going like this as, as we get closer to this year and come back in the next class and yeah, okay, cliffhanger. It's crazy. It's, it's nuts, the stuff I found. Okay, so... Uh, then they will deliver you up to pers- uh, up to tribulation. Who's they? It's they, you know, the rest of the world. And kill you, and you will be hated by, by what? By all nations for my name's sake. So, so again, we're getting a hint that it's global. Many will be offended, betray one another, hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up. And because lawlessness will abound, do we see that in our in our time? I mean, is it more than ever before in history? I don't know. I mean, certainly in terms of like, you know, the United States of America, I mean, I would say that for sure, right? Western civilization. Western civilization, I would go that far. And that's the spirit of Antichrist, by the way. Boy, is that strong in the world right now at this very moment, right? Like I said, enjoy the time we're in, okay? We'll abound the love of many, we'll grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. That's a hint about the timing of the rapture. If we get raptured out of here before all this stuff happens, what am I enduring to the end? Right. So, and, and, you know, that's Bill was up there for my big teaching about the time of the rapture. It's kind of fun, right? Yep. Yep. Missed that campfire. That was good. Uh, Finally, one last verse. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached. Here we go. Look in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So when we see all this stuff and, and based on Jesus's words, again, what I think we should be looking for to distinguish this, what he just said from every other time in human history because that's the purpose of this, so that we know when it happens. We want to see it uh, global in scale, like it, like it has never happened before in all of human history, every single one of them. And also, again, wouldn't it be interesting if every single one of these, these, these parameters that Jesus names 
that if we look at like actual charts and graphs, like the United States Geological Survey, stuff like that, right? UN Statistical Yearbook, that we actually see this trend over the last couple hundred, even couple thousand years, just going like this toward the end. I'm not saying I found that, but come back for the next class. Okay, seriously. Uh, okay, so again, one last time and then we're done. So what are we looking for when we come back? Remember, next week is Nomen AD. Please come for that. It's going to be amazing. The next class we're doing with this stuff is a whole month from now. Will you survive until then? I'm going to be chomping the bit. But in one month, we'll be back here for, for, to continue this topic. And this is what we're going to look for when we come back. Unprecedented human history, global in scale, not just one, but all four. One horseman naturally follows the other. They're in the exact right order. Okay. And finally, when, when any of these sets out, once they set out, they continue riding, which means, according to our model, that all four horsemen today are riding presently. Cool? Yeah. Are you intrigued? Yeah. Okay, me too. So come back in, you know, a month. But yeah, don't forget, please come back next week. And actually, uh, I'm going to throw up our slide to advertise that just so we don't forget, right? So, oh, this is this Sunday, actually. Uh, I'd love it if you're all there on Sunday, 5 o'clock at the Domes on Jamaica, this Sunday. That's the big event. And then uh, following that, our, ne our class next Thursday, it's going to be Nomina D. So, oh, okay, I have done enough talking. So, uh, Debbie, could I invite you to come up here and close in prayer? Yes, come on up. Come on. I'll, get, uh, you, I'll stand right with you. You just say, thank you, Lord, for a great class. And bless Ryan for being such a cool guy. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. I always have someone come up and, and close in prayer. And, um, but you guys are new, so I'm not going to pick on you. So, Okay. <laughs> All right. Heavenly Father, we would like to thank you for allowing us to come today and gather and to learn more about your word so that we will be prepared and, and be able yeah, to feel much more at ease and have peace and grow our faith in you. And in Jesus' name, we thank you. Yeah, amen. amen. Wow. I mean, that was a good prayer. Give her a hand. My gosh. <laughs> you were all shy. That was an excellent prayer. Good way to close up. All right. Uh, love you guys. Thank you for coming. Uh, hope to see you on Sunday. Definitely hope to see you next Thursday. And in the meantime, Ben, filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, amen. All right. Love you guys.